Um, thank you all for coming to the IRIS book event. This is the first time that this event has been held at the ISS RNC. Um, so maybe that's something we'll do in the future. And in fact, it's the first time that it's been held um, in person. We've had to do them as Zoom events previously, so it's nice to do this in person. My name is Lisa Sedaris. I'm a professor of environmental studies at University of California, Santa Barbara. And I oversee the nomination and selection process for the IRIS Book Award, which is an initiative of the Center for Religion and the Human at Indiana University, where I was formerly on faculty. For our program today, we'll begin with introductions and proceed to the award ceremony and conversation. After the introductions, Dr. Rubenstein will read a selection from her award-winning book, Worlds Without End, The Many Lives of the Multiverse. This will be followed by a conversation and reflections with our two esteemed guests, Alexis McLeod and Catherine Newell. In our last 10 minutes or so, we'll turn to take some questions from you, um, questions and comments from the audience. Before I begin, I want to thank the, uh, the scholars who served as nominators for this year's prize and the jury members who made the final very difficult selection. Um, thanks also to Jacob Boss, who has helped with this process over the years. Sitting in the back, thank you, Jacob. And I'll say more about the, um, the award and its sponsors in just a moment. So let me first introduce our discussants. Alexis McLeod is a professor of religious studies at Indiana University. His recent work focuses on varying application of global philosophical methodologies and the study of systems of global synthesis in early China, Mesoamerica, India, Persia, and West Africa, among others. He also works on philosophical issues in the history of medicine and the history and philosophy of the traditional Asian martial arts. He's quite a prolific author. His published works include Understanding Asian Philosophy, Bloomsbury 2014, Theories of Truth in Chinese Philosophy, Roman and Littlefield, 2015. Astronomy um, in, ancient, in the Ancient World, Springer, 2016. This is like a book a year, as you can see. <laughs> Philosophy of the Ancient Maya, Lexington Books, 2017. The Philosophical Thought of Wang Chung, Paul Grave Macmillan, 2018. The Tao of Madness, Oxford University Press, 2021. And he is also the editor of the Bloomsbury Research Handbook of Early Chinese Ethics and Political Philosophy, Bloomsbury 2019, and the co-author of Transcendence and Non-Naturalism in Early Chinese Thought, um, Bloomsbury 2020, uh, which is the first of three planned volumes on non-naturalist views in early China. Additionally, he has a forthcoming book, or perhaps it's come out now, with Cambridge University Press titled An Introduction to Mesoamerican Philosophy and a forthcoming edited collection. I told you, he's a prolific author. The Rutledge Companion to Global Philosophy. He's currently completing a monograph titled Creating the Dragon on the links between mythology, narrative, and the construction of identity in the traditional Asian, Asian martial arts. Catherine Newell is a scholar of the conjoined histories of religion and science. Her first book, Destined for the Stars, um, Faith, the Future, and the Final Frontier, University of Pittsburgh Press, which we heard about this morning. If you were here at the plenary session, we were talking about space. You heard about that book already. Um, traces post-World War II American zeal for space exploration back to 19th century religious belief in American manifest destiny. Newell focuses on the artists, historians, and scientists who popularized space exploration by framing the conquest of the Final Frontier as the religious and cultural legacy of the conquest of the American West. Her most recent work examines how individuals use scientific concepts about food and diet as the basis for spiritual practice. Her new book, Food Faiths, Diet, Religion, and the Science of Spiritual Eating, is forthcoming from Lexington Books. It explores how science filters through popular culture to affect the spiritual inclinations of individuals and investigates the influence of religion on science, biomedicine, and contemporary spirituality. Additionally, Newell has published articles and book chapters on dystopic science fiction uh, nature and nature religion, the religious origins of American vegetarianism, and how biblical injunctions to, quote, rule, the, rule over the earth still inflect debates about environmental science and management in the 21st century. Our guest of honor and award recipient is Mary Jane Rubenstein. Rubenstein is professor of religion and science and society at Wesleyan University and is affiliated with the philosophy department and the feminist gender and sexuality studies program at Wesleyan. Did I already say Wesleyan? 
She holds a BA from Williams College, um, an MPhil, I guess Master of Philosophy, from Cambridge University, and a PhD from Columbia University. Her research unearths the philosophies and histories of religion and science, especially in relation to cosmology, ecology, and space travel. She's the author of many books, most recently Astrotopia, which you'll be hearing more about this afternoon in her keynote talk. Astrotopia, the Dangerous Religion of the Corporate Space Race, University of Chicago, 2022. Pantheologies, Gods, Worlds, and Monsters, Columbia University Press, 2018. Uh, Worlds Without End, which is the award-winning book for today, The Many Lives of the Multiverse, Columbia University Press, 2014, and Strange Wonder, The Closure of Metaphysics and the Opening of Awe, also Columbia, 20, uh, 2009. She is also co-editor with Catherine Keller of Entangled Worlds, Religion, Science, and the New Materialisms, uh, Fordham University Press, 2017, also a very prolific author and co-author with Thomas Carlson and Mark C. Taylor of Image, Three Inquiries in Technology and Imagination, University of uh, Chicago Press 2021. And of course, she is also now the winner of the 2022 IRIS Award. So to tell you a bit about the IRIS Award, it's an annual prize of $2,000 given to an outstanding work at the intersection of science, religion, nature, and technology. The Book Prize is one of several initiatives, initiatives supported by a $1 million grant from the Henry Luce Foundation titled Being Human, Public Scholarship as Theological Anthropology. The award and associated activities are organized under the auspices of the Center for Religion and the Human at Indiana University, uh, co-directed by Winifred Sullivan and J. Cameron Carter. I also want to invite you to check out the Center for Religion and the Human's book series with IU Press, for which Winnie Sullivan and I are the series editors, um, and consider submitting a proposal. You can go to the Center website for more about that. The IRIS Award recognizes scholarship that offers new insights into the meaning and status of the human vis-a-vis -vis the natural world and non-human life, and in relation to cultural historical forces emanating from religion and theology, science and technology. Nominations for the Book Award are made by active scholars in the fields of religious studies, religion and nature, science and technology and religion, and by academic and popular presses. More information about the nomination process is available on the Center for Religion and the Human website, um, and nominations for the 2023 prize are currently open. The award especially recognizes scholarship that implicitly or explicitly explores questions of the human work that thinks beyond existing categories or methods in religion and science, that exhibits intellectual humility, skillful integration of interdisciplinary perspectives, and exemplary writing. Uh, and the books considered for this award are, uh, must be two years past their publication date, and they cover about a seven-year span. Uh, two years past their publication date in order that their impact can be assessed, um, but also, of course, that means that that's a wide number, a wide range of books over a number of years, so the competition can be pretty fierce. Rubenstein's World Without End stood out among many excellent contenders for this award. She shows how the idea of a multiverse, which imagines our universe as one among potentially countless others, has long fascinated philosophers and theologians, among others. Rubenstein links contemporary scientific models of the multiverse to their ancient and pre-modern predecessors. For many, the allure of the multiverse is that it purports to explain the origin and nature of the universe without positing a divine creator. And yet, as Rubenstein shows, the multiverse idea replaces the creator God with an additional article of faith, namely the existence of universes beyond, before, or after our own. She shows how, in attempting to sidestep metaphysics, the multiverse scenarios directly collide with it. Far from invalidating multiverse hypotheses, this collision of physics and metaphysics secures the scientific viability of the multiverse. Rubenstein illustrates the contemporary ideas of the multiverse are a continuation of long-standing perplexities about the origins and nature of the cosmos and the ability of humans to comprehend it. The jurors for the Iris Book Award praised Worlds Without End as, quote, a delightful tour of a topic that was once esoteric, but is now hovering in the edges of science fact, that we do not exist in a universe, but rather in a multiverse. They hailed the book as a fascinating and entertaining exploration 
of the history of an idea that just won't quit. From the ancient atomists to modern cosmologists, the hunch that one plus one equals or might add up to infinity has influenced everything from physics to theology. It's a testament to Rubinstein's prowess as a writer and her affability as a narrator that a generally unintuitive notion, many worlds, not just one, is rendered not only comprehensible, but engaging and enjoyable. The book is witty, erudite, and somewhat mind-blowing. So congratulations, Dr. Rubenstein, receiving the Iris Award. I have an actual award. So as you know, if you have read any of Mary Jane's work, she is really a fantastic writer. So I asked her to read a selection from her book, Worlds Without End. Would you like to do that up here? OK. And I will join you over there. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that immensely generous introduction um, and for this just beautiful. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, didn't even think that there'd be an actual award. This is. Um, it's beautiful. Thank you. And it's such an honor. Um, I can't quite believe that I'm in the company of George Haskell, whose uh, book Songs of Trees won the award in 2020, and Terence Keel, whose remarkable book Divine Variations uh, won it last year. These are just magisterial works um, that I rely on and teach. Um, so it, it, this is it's humbling. So thank you. Um, thanks so much to Lee to the Luce Foundation, to Indiana University's Center for Religion and the Human, um, to the panel of reviewers, if you happen to be out there, um, to Wendy Lochner at Columbia University Press, um, and of course to our discussants, Catherine Newell and Alexis McLeod. Um, I was going to ask, so I was, I was, I was preparing to um, say thank you also to um, Iris, who I imagined it's, this award is called the Iris Award, and I was like, Iris, and I, I was imagining some like 97-year-old lady donor, and I was like, Lisa, who is Iris? Like, who is she? And, what? and, uh, and Lisa was like, oh, oh my, not that Iris. This is, it's Iris the goddess, Iris the goddess, which is to say um, the rainbow. She's the, she's, she is rainbow. She personifies the rainbow. Um, she is a messenger of the gods, um, a little less well-known than Hermes, um, but pretty remarkable. Um, Iris is the daughter of Thaumas, the sea god, whose name gives us the word wonder, Thaumatzein in Greek. Um, daughter of Thaumas and Electra, who is the companion of Persephone's. Um, as you may know, Thaumas and Electra's other daughters are the harpies. So I am looking forward to the Luce Foundation's uh, upcoming funding a Harpies Award for books written by nasty bird-like lady monsters uh, who carry evildoers off the underworld. Um, and I would very humbly like to submit myself for consideration for that one, too. Um, OK. A quick orientation before I read a couple of pages. Um, so I, this is just to reiterate what Lisa has said. The multiverse is this idea that our entire universe, like everything that James Webb is collecting right now, all the light that we cannot see, all of that, which is perhaps infinite, uh, is just one part, small part, of a vast compendium of other universes, maybe even an infinite number of other universes called uh, the multiverse. It's a hypothesis. And the more I learned about this, the more I was like, what on earth is science getting up to? And I would talk to my friends in physics and my friends in astronomy, and they were like, these guys are nuts. I have absolutely no idea. Um, and it was sounding to me much more like the stuff that we all study, which is to say mythology, science fiction, philosophy, even theology than it did science. So my big question was like, why does modern cosmology want a multiverse? What, is it, what does it do for it? And as Lisa mentioned, what it does is it gives it a fundamental explanatory principle. Turns out that the universe is organized in such a way that if any of its fundamental constants were any different, if gravity were any stronger, planets would collapse into the sun. If gravity were any weaker, planets would fly off into space. If the weak nuclear force were any weaker, atoms couldn't hold together. It, it seems as though all of these fundamental forces um, of nature are fine-tuned in such a way that they're like balanced on this razor's edge of perfection and have to be this way, otherwise we couldn't be at all. Like the universe couldn't be at all. So what, like why? 
the fundamental physicists ask, because they're basically metaphysicians. They don't just like deal with the categories. They ask about them. Why are they like this? And of course, at this point, that our like, friends, the theologians, bound in, and they're like, it's because of God, we told you, <laughs> right? God is like this cosmic mix master who's like, okay, we're going to do like this much gravity and this much dark energy or cosmological cons, this much nuclear force, the electron's going to be just like that. And the physicists are like, don't give me God. I want a fundamental explanation, but I don't want it to be God. And increasingly, the multiverse becomes an attractive proposition because what the multiverse gives you is basically monkeys at typewriters, which is to say it gives you an infinite number of universes over infinite time with whatever, whatever values for, fine, for, uh, for constants they might take on gravity, this too much gravity, too little gravity, right? and universes are just, as David Hume would say, botched and bungled throughout infinite history, and every once in a while, again like the monkey at the typewriter typing out Shakespeare, a universe turns out okay, and then we happen to be in that universe. So the twin principles of like accident and infinity, infinite amount of time and space and just accidental variation, produce a rival explanation to God as the kind of cosmic mix master. As the physicist Bernard Carr says, uh, if you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. Um, but as, as Lisa was mentioning, it's not clear to me that an infinite number of totally inaccessible hypothetical universes is less of a metaphysical commitment <laughs> than an infinite God. Okay. So this is from the last chapter, which I've called Unendings on the Entanglement of Science and Religion. At first blush, it looks as though the boundary between science and religion is clear when it comes to the multiverse. Just as the atomist philosophers did 2,500 years ago, modern multiverse theorists proclaim an infinite number of worlds in part to avoid the conclusion that this world was somehow designed for us. If an endless number of all sorts of universes actually exist, the scientists reason, then it doesn't matter how improbable or razor's edgy our fundamental parameters might be. The random generation of universes throughout infinite time and space ensures that even a cosmological constant as absurdly small as ours was bound to arise at some point. In short, the multiverse does away with the need for a creator god, at least as an explanatory principle. In this light, some theologians have disparaged the multiverse as, quote, the last resort of the desperate atheist, unquote. Among these theologians is Cardinal Christoph Schoenbern, the current Roman Catholic Archbishop of Vienna, who accuses the multiverse hypothesis and what he calls neo-Darwinism of having been, quote, invented to avoid the overwhelming evidence for purpose and design found in modern science. In response to this invention, he resolves, quote, the Catholic Church will once again defend human reason by proclaiming that the imminent design evident in nature is real. At first glance, Schoenborn's use of the adverb again might call to mind a history of torrid conflicts between religion and natural science, placing the multiverse in an unsavory lineage that stretches from the slandered Epicureans through the executed Giordano Bruno and the prosecuted John Thomas Scopes. On the surface then, the question of infinite worlds seems to stage a simple, familiar drama between the forces of dogma and innovation, sacred doctrine and secular reason, God and the multiverse. And yet these lines become increasingly crossed, twisted, and even knotted the more closely we examine this controversy. It's important to note, for example, that Schoenborn does not accuse the multiverse of violating Christian doctrine, but of violating modern science. In response, he commits the church not to defending God against the multiverse, but to defending reason against the multiverse. Throughout history, he writes, the church has defended the truths of faith given by Jesus Christ. But in the modern era, the Catholic church is in the odd position of standing in firm defense of reason as well. Standing firm in this odd position. Schoenborn marshals neither the Bible, nor the fathers, nor the doctors of the church to assert the singularity of the cosmos. He never calls the multiverse hypothesis heretical, incompatible with scripture, or an insult to divine infinity. Rather, he calls it an abdication of human intelligence. In particular, he charges appealing to an infinite number of invisible universes amounts to giving up the search for an explanation of the world as it appears to us. 
What are we doing dreaming about other universes when we have not managed to address global warming or malaria or the common cold? Insofar as the multiverse hypothesis is said to be neither provable nor falsifiable, Karl Popper, the archbishop and like-minded critics accuse multiverse cosmologies of falling outside the proper purview of science. Of course, one can always accuse these critics of hiding fundamentally theological motivations behind a scientific smokescreen, of saying their concern is really for human intelligence when it's really for intelligent design. But whether or not this is true, such an argument is of limited value. To reduce Schoenborn and others' critiques of the multiverse to some sort of secret theology is to overestimate the metaphysical power of the position they criticize. After all, while the principles of accident and infinity may do away with the need for a creator god, they hardly disprove the existence of such a god, nor are they even incompatible with one. As Thomas Aquinas argued immediately after positing his teleological argument, which becomes the intelligent design hypothesis, it doesn't matter what sort of material process an atheist posits as the creative force of the universe. The theist can always retort, God made that material process. For this reason, there are plenty of self-professed Christian physicists and philosophers who affirm the existence of the multiverse with no theological difficulty at all. Simply put, a Christian can simply affirm that God created the multiverse that created the universe. That having been said, such an argument, however updated its evidence, would be in principle no more forceful than the traditional argument from design and would be subject to the same logical and ethical critiques that Philo levels against it in David Hume's dialogues. Depending on the thinker, it might even be subject to a trenchant theological critique, because it's not clear that the god of the design argument, you know, the one who like bangs the big bang, like bang, and then he's done, and then science takes off, um, bears much resemblance to the god who breathes into the nostrils of an earth creature, or who delivers an oppressed people from slavery, or whose prophets implore the nation to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your god. In short, there's a chasm between what some theologians following a fragment in Blaise Pascal's Pensée called the god of the philosophers on the one hand, and the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on the other. One of the most powerful critics of this god of the philosophers was the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Writing from his cell in a Gestapo prison, he'd been part of a failed plot to assassinate Hitler and was executed just days before the end of the war. Bonhoeffer assailed the kind of thinking that makes God into a metaphysical principle at the edge of the world rather than an ethical force in the midst of it. Religious people, he says, speak of God at a point where human knowledge is at an end. He's explaining this in a letter to Eberhard Betke. Actually, he says, this God is a deus ex machina that they're always bringing on the scene, either to appear to solve insoluble problems or to provide strength when human powers fail. The problem with appealing to God at the limits of human knowledge is that as the scope of human knowledge expands, the space for God progressively shrinks until God is edged out of the world completely. Now that humanity doesn't need God to explain the fall of rains or the rotation of planets or even the creation and distribution of matter, God becomes confined at best to that one little ocular mechanism that biologists can't explain, or to the bacterial flagellum, or to the 10 to the negative 34 seconds before the Big Bang hypothesis kicks in to explain creation. God becomes nothing more than a first nudge, a stopgap invoked to plug the remaining holes in human understanding. So the god of the gaps recedes with each passing age, disappearing from view like some far off galaxy. And in the meantime, we've learned nothing about how we're supposed to live in relation to this stopgap god, how to respond to genocide, what to do in the face of escalating global poverty, or whether the existence of an infinite number of worlds means that we can let this one warm and melt with impunity. For Bonhoeffer, then, the whole endeavor to prove the existence of God outside the world is flawed from the outset. I'd like to speak of a God, he says, not at the boundaries, but at the center. He, uh, God, he says, is the beyond in the midst of our lives, an indwelling force that precisely in refusing to swoop in and solve our unanswered problems calls people to what he calls responsible action in the world, even to life in a Gestapo prison, so that in his words, the coming generation might go on living. 
Perhaps needless to say, the god of the design hypothesis does none of this in his sporadic plugging of epistemological holes. It might be then that the argument from design constitutes not just unsatisfying science, but unsatisfying theology. And finally, to dismiss those who criticize the multiverse as secret theologians would be to miss the extent to which the multiverse theories themselves function theologically, colliding with invisible divinities and realms in the very gesture of trying to avoid them, displaying a remarkable faith in what St. Paul might call things hoped for and things not seen. Thanks. How's the sound? Does it sound okay? Let's see what time. If we, maybe I can just start since I have the prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question. Um, I would be really interested to hear how, um, how scientists and especially theoretical physicists have responded to your forays into cosmology and astronomy. Um, that is a great question. So, uh, people who've actually, uh, physicists who've um, read the book, um, have actually said, yeah, you know what, we're, we're, we're bad philosophers. This is the problem. The problem is that physicists, um, theoretical physicists, right? Um, theoretical physicists are often operating, especially cosmologists, are operating in this, um, in this already metaphysical terrain. I think, as I've suggested, the minute you ask why are the parameters the way they are, I think you're on metaphysical ground and you can only get a metaphysical answer. You can only get either something like God or something like the multiverse, neither of which is strictly speaking within the boundaries of say observational or experimental physics. Um, so they're on this metaphysical ground and they don't know what to do there. Um, they sense it's something big, and so what they say is something like, ha ha, there's no God, and then, you know, and the publishing industry doesn't help, and the news industry doesn't help, because then you get more books sold if Stephen Hawking has been telling you that there's no God. It's, like, it's a lot more interesting to say Stephen Hawking says there's no God than Stephen Hawking has a fascinating no-boundary proposal within which wherever you go in the universe, you loop back around. Like, that's not going to sell anything. But Stephen Hawking says there's no God that sells something. in the right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, for the most part, they've said things like, yeah, the, you know, we really need to reinvigorate the liberal arts so that our physics students are really studying philosophy so they know what they're saying when they make these large, uh, these large claims. So for the most part, it's been a real non-problem, actually. It's, I know, I know, I've made friends, I've had, um, I've got pals, <laughs> I love them, so that's been really great. So first, I just want to thank you for, uh, for writing this fantastic book. Um, I, I learned a lot from this book. Um, it's actually, it's, it has the features of what I think are the, the kind of best writing in that not only did I learn a lot from it, but it actually helped me think in new ways about the work that I'm doing um, as well. So thank you for that. Um, there, there's one thing, actually one, one quote, I, I was wondering if you get to, would get to this one in your reading. One thing that really kind of hit me when you write, wrote in this last chapter as well, that quote, every multiverse hypothesis opens in one way or another onto uncannily metaphysical, even theological terrain. Every scenario requires us to assent to worlds, gods, or generative principles that remain, in the, eye, in the words of an old English hymn, in light inaccessible hid from our eyes, end quote. It's interesting because I had been kind of trying to make a, a case um, for the connection between um, philosophy and theology and, and, um, and contemporary um, physics in my, old, in my earlier book, and I did not do it anywhere nearly as well as you did. So I think what I'm going to do when, I, when this comes up is I'm just going to hand people your book and say, look at Mary Jane's book, she does it better than I do. So the, I, I wanted to ask a quick question about um, intellectual formation um, in, in, in the natural sciences. Um, the, the, this response to, uh, to views of the multiverse, either acceptance of them or putting them forth or resisting them, seems to have to do, as you, as you t discuss, um, with this issue of a, a, a divine creator. But I wonder to what extent there, there is, the, I wonder to what extent the particular intellectual formation of individual scientists may, may explain the way in which they either 
are okay with the kind of multiverse idea in, in all of its kind of philosophical trappings or whether they resist it. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on, so I wanted to get a, a sense of uh, your sense of, is this people who are taking a lot of philosophy and, and religious studies and theology cl classes, or is it just people who are kind of, uh, who, are, who are willing to accept these kind of views, or is there, do you think there's something else going on? Yeah, I, I, I think that the more um, philosophy and theology classes uh, physicists have taken, the more reluctant they are to get on the multiverse bus um, because they see where it's headed and they see what the assumptions are that you have to you sort of have to swallow in order to, to this is, I, now I'm mixing metaphors, you have to swallow assumptions to get on a multiverse bus, it's terrible. But they, they, they see what it is they're assenting to, right? Um, so for example, um, so Paul Davies, for example, who teaches here, um, is a major critic of the multiverse because he says we just don't have the data to make these sort of ecstatic extrapolations about infinite universes nested within infinite universes. Um, and he is this, this very, you know, well-trained, very well-rounded kind of Renaissance thinker. Um, but the, it, it tends to be folks who are more narrowly in mathematics and physics who get themselves into this funny hole and they're like, oh my gosh, what, wait a minute, what if we're a simulation and the people running the simulation are like our gods, right? And they get to this point, they're like, my mind is blown. And the folks who study this are like, dude, that is like William Paley. Like that is, we did this a while ago. And so and I, I, know, I know where that's coming from and I know how to, um, so th that tends to be, the, 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 the mapping tends to be that. Like the more philosophy and theology you have, the less interested you are in the multiverse hypothesis. But I think what I'm, I think what I, what I got excited about in this book um, was that it seemed, this particular site of inquiry seemed to open up a slightly different way of going about the religion and science thing than I think um, a lot of folks often do, and all of you are exceptions to this. Um, but that it doesn't, it, 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 the, the question of whether science or religion is, is right in this regard is so, uh, uninteresting because it's so unanswerable and it's so uh, that it's just a dead end from the beginning so either you don't talk about it or you've got to find a different way to talk about it and it seems that the much more interesting way to talk about it is to say to see that like these contemporary theories of the cosmos are themselves producing these mythologies, these, these, these theologies. They're doing like creative, constructive theologies in their own right. And the least inter interesting question you can ask is like, is that compatible with the God of Abraham, <laughs> Isaac, and Like, of course it is. Everything is compatible with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if you want it to be, right? Um, the much more interesting way to do it as a religious studies person, I think, is to say like, look at this amazing new site of human production and creation, right? Um, and it would just be great if they knew that that's what they were up to. Thank you for all that. Um, so we have all this talk of physicists and philosophers and cosmologists and high levels of thinking. So I want to ask you about the television show Community. Uh, specifically, and for those of you who are fans, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Season three, episode four, there's a plot line where every toss of a dice leads to a different timeline in a different universe. Uh, and this might sound familiar if you don't watch Community, which that's your problem, you should watch it. But uh, you might have heard during the pandemic reference to us all being in the darkest timeline. This was a joke in Community that kept coming back, that of all of the universes in which they popped out of, that somehow uh, there was someplace else a dark timeline where everything had gone completely off the rails. Somehow that perfectly summed up 2020 to a lot of people, including me. Uh, so. But this plot line was just one of, I think, hundreds in popular culture where uh, everything from community to sliding doors to everything everywhere all at once, uh, where it's taken for granted that the multiverse hypothesis or the multiverse itself exists and people know enough about it to have it be the main plot conceit, uh, seems to say that this hypothesis appears to have gone mainstream. So you uh, referenced the same uh, quote that you opened the book with, uh, Bernard Carr's, if you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. Uh, so where all this is leading is the, for those of us who work at the intersections of popular culture and religion, uh, there's that idea that comes from Weber and Eliade, et cetera, that uh, culture itself represents or illustrates to us some of these sublimated 
religious ideas and nostalgias. And so uh, it occurs to me that perhaps the multiverse and its representations in popular culture is exactly that, that it's living in a secular culture where people are trying to have some kind of evidence of or version of the universe that does have either this prime mover or that there's uh, something that sets all this in action. So um, really my question is, do you think it's possible that the multiverse's popularity is due to this idea that if we can't have a god, maybe we can have a multiverse? Great, great. Um, I think there are two possibilities here to explain the popularity of multiverse scenarios. Yes, you're right. I mean, I talk a bit about this absurd episode of Family Guy in the book. There's the community dice toss, which every one of my students still knows, right? That's an old episode at this point, and they still know it. Yeah. Um, there's the Spider-Verse, there's uh, Doctor Strange, there's everything everywhere all at once with the everything bagel there, right? Um, we just, we, we're, and so first of all, all of these cultural uptakes of this multiverse hypothesis are only interested in one of them. There are like, there, I mean, I suggest there are sort of five distinct multiverse hypotheses going on right now circulating in modern physics. Um, there's the string theory landscape, there's the inflationary multiverse, there is a, a sort of black hole universe, there's a simulation hypothesis, and there is this one, which is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And the idea, as you probably know, is um, that uh, every time any subatomic or macroscopic decision is made, um, the universe branches into versions in which uh, one said, uh, you said yes in one universe, you said no in one universe, you tripped in one universe, you didn't trip in another universe. Like any possibility keeps splitting the universe into copies, effectively copies of itself. So first of all, that's the only one that gets taken up. The other ones don't, and that's interesting. And I think part of it is because as weird and fractal and destabilizing as the many worlds interpretation is, it does all of that for the sake precisely of resurrecting a kind of God figure, which is to say the unity of the wave function. From the perspective of the wave function itself, all of these universes are part of this totally necessary, completely determined um, macroverse um, in which there's actually no free choice and there's no, because everything is just evolving according to all of its possible uh, roots. So there is a kind of theological longing, I think among quantum theorists who go for the many worlds hypothesis, because they're like, it is, does not make any sense to say that an electron can choose where to decohere. Um, and insofar as that's not possible, the, uni the whole universe has to split, right? So you preserve a kind of totally classic universe, actually, by going for an infinite number of many worlds universes. So there, I think there is a kind of theological longing there. My other sense, though, is that um, these, all of these, um, these texts, these cultural texts, play on the question of the, almost all of them, individual choice. Did you read that? I mean, a genuinely awful book. The, um, so. Uh, Oh gosh, we're on the Midnight Library. That like that thing. It's you know a, a woman who you know chose the wrong guy to date, and like she goes through all of these worlds in which she dated other guys, and would she have been happier dating these other guys? Anyway, um, all of these things tend to tend to play on um, on personal choice, on whom we've decided to love, on where we've decided to work, on how we've decided to make war with the universe, whatever it is. And you see these other. Um, there seems to be, I, I, I don't know, I, it won't be any news to the folks in this room that um, I think for the, for the millennials and the Zoomers, the reality of the climate crisis um, and the reality of the decisions that human beings have made is so pressing and so uh, dismally hanging um, that the question is always like, is there anything else anybody could have done? Um, so this question of free choice, of living otherwise, of other possible worlds um, seems to be a really active and open one right now. And for anybody who's like into this kind of literature, the only decent treatment I have seen in like decades of the many worlds hypothesis in a fictional account is uh, Ted Chang's uh, Anxiety is the Dizziness of Freedom, which actually takes on this question of freedom and determinism in uh, like an infinite number of totally determined um, quantum universes. Yeah, thank you for that. Do you wanna... So I wanted to ask a question about um, 
potentially different ways in to this idea of a multiverse and whether kind of any contemporary um, physical scientists are taking these ways. And so there are two in particular that I kind of uh, that had in mind. There's a very famous view, um, of the, the late philosopher David Lewis, who came, who had this position on uh, modality. Um, so modality gets used to explain um, di different modal possibilities, right? So the idea of I could have sat here rather than sitting there, right? And so one one way to explain this is that there, there are multiple, wor there are many worlds in which you have counter parts that do these various things, right? Um, and he, is, he, gets a, he gives a kind of more modal realist view in which all these worlds actually exist, um, and that, 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 which is something like this multiverse idea, um, which maybe was influential for some of the scientists you talk about. Um, there's also uh, Buddhist ideas that we were talking about before in which they, uh, the kind of Mahayana cosmologies of, of many worlds they, they get there through kind of consideration of different, vastly different kinds of experience. So the possibility that I might experience the world in completely different ways than someone else, such that those actually represent different worlds. Um, and I wonder the extent to, is there a sense in which, so many of the physical scientists you're talking about, probably most of them, um, are concerned with this kind of question of avoiding divine design. Um, are there other um, kind of, are there, are there other explanations that they give and say, oh, here's why multi, we, should buy, we should buy multiverses, because they also have these other kind of like, um, they, they, all, they also have these other explanations, these other positive effects, or there are these kind of reasons for accepting, like the modal reason or the experiential reason. Are there kind of um, extra um, avoiding theology reasons, if you will, that they give? <laughs> Um, yes. So the okay. The reason for and I, I, I I'm speaking too globally here. The reason for the um, the growing consensus among theoretical physicists that we're probably in a multiverse is this avoidance of the God hypothesis. But these ideas have been around for decades and decades, um, and those initial. Uh, theorists were not themselves seeking to avoid a God hypothesis. Um, so, and I'll get to the question of Mahayana cosmology in a minute. Um, so uh, Hugh Everett um, in the 1950s was the first person to posit uh, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. This had very little to do with, um, again, avoiding a God hypothesis. He was just um, baffled at the Copenhagen suggestion that the subatomic world behaves um, according to the, like the dizzying logic of quantum mechanics where a particle can be in two places at once and it can um split in in half and then go back and join itself that it can interfere with its own past and present he's like it's not possible that that's possible at the that that happens at the subatomic level and doesn't happen at the macroscopic level. After all, we are made of atoms. So if they're behaving this way, we must behave this way. So it's this kind of longing for philosophical coherence, I think, that leads him to say there is no decoherence at the quantum level. All there is is this sort of smooth splitting of universes forever. Um, and then in the 1980s, you start getting um, the inflationary theory of cosmology. Um, this is, um, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a total mess. The problem is that um, the more, you know, the better pictures that we get of our cosmic microwave background, which is like an early snapshot shot of the universe, just as atoms cooled enough sufficiently to, um, uh, to decouple as light. Um, it's like 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The better and better our resolution gets of this cosmic microwave background, the more and more we see that these areas of the cosmos look very much like those areas of the cosmos, as though they somehow interacted with one another. And yet, if you take classic measurements of the expansion of space-time, they wouldn't have had enough time to be in communication with one another. Therefore, something must have flung space-time out at the moment of the Big Bang faster, even faster than the speed of light. What you say? Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Turns out nothing in space can go faster than the speed of light, but space-time itself can. So they posit this thing called inflationary energy, which hypothetically pushes the entire cosmos out faster than the speed of light in order to account for these funny non-anomalies in the cosmic microwave background. And the issue is, as two very brave Russian theoretical physicists, Alexander Vilenkin and Andre Linde realize, they're like, crap. Once you turn on inflationary energy, which goes at this like infernal speed, once you turn it on, we don't know how to turn it off. 
Like we can't figure out, it may relax in little pockets, but it's created so much more space time elsewhere that it has to continue elsewhere. Therefore, if inflation happened to produce our universe, it must be producing universes in other places. And these guys in the 1980s posited this theory. They called, uh, one of them called it eternal inflation, the other chaotic inflation. And everybody was like, these Russian guys are nuts. Like, why would they be talking about an infinite number of universes? Fast forward to 1998, the discovery of dark energy, and for reasons that I will explain later, uh, over drinks, um, everybody's so freaked out that Steven Weinberg, who's like the guy everybody listens to, is like, you know what? Call Andre and Alex because I think they're I think that their multiverse theories are the only way to get us out of this God problem. So they like dust off, they, they call them, they're like, we're so sorry. Did we make fun of you for 20 years? We are so sorry about that. Um, we think there's probably a multiverse because it's the only way out. So yeah, so the, the, the theories didn't themselves come from, from them, but they, they, they sort of gain credence this way. Um, huh, different way in. My, right, so I, I, I was saying to this to Alexis right before this panel that um, as I was writing the book, I, you know, I, I teach religion. I know about Mahayana cosmology. Like I know about Buddha worlds a little bit, enough to teach it to my undergrads, thank you. Um, and I was like, you know, it's really weird to be writing a multiverse without talking about Buddha worlds. And, I, and every time I tried to do it, it didn't work. And at first I thought, well, maybe this is because I don't command Pali and Sanskrit in ways that, I, that allow me to interact with these texts, the way that I can interact with the sources and the languages I do know. Um, maybe that's the problem. But I think the real problem was that the book isn't like a world religions textbook on the multiverse in places that it shows up. Um, what the book is, is like an, is an intellectual history of a problem. And this problem dates back to the atomists 2,500 years ago who were like, we hate this idea of a creator. It makes people act terribly. So we're going to posit an infinite number of worlds. And then it comes, you know, resurrected, it resurrects itself over, over the generations. Um, that's a problem. Uh, Buddhists don't have a problem with an infinite number of worlds, and they don't have a problem with a singular creator god. So it just doesn't emerge as an issue within Buddhist philosophy. Um, so, and my sense, again, is that. Um, the, you know, the infinite worlds of Mahayana contemplation are there precisely for that, for contemplation, um, to, uh, to uh, assist in the detachment from our absurd attachments to the things of this world by showing us just how absolutely vast the cosmos and the many cosmoi are, totally different from trying to find a cosmic explanatory principle. So it's, you're, they're, 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 you're, it's exactly what you're saying. They're like totally different ways in, yeah. That's kind of along the lines of what I wanted to ask about because uh, I appreciated that you started by saying, and what I loved about the book is that it is such a, dare I say, fun way to reapproach the, as the philosophers upstairs in my building sometimes say, science versus religion problem, uh, but to which I cover my eyes in pain. Um, but one kind of interesting theme that keeps coming back in the book and I think is indicative of some of the uh, similar but also very, I think, fun or problems in the history of religion and science is things like uh, the recurrence of recurrence in religion and how uh, the resistance of Western science to the idea of recurrence, the ways in which that is so kind of firmly anchored in uh, the, essentially the cultures from which, for lack of a better phrase, the cultures from which uh, these sciences came from, and yet the persistent denial that on the part of scientists saying that, no, 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 we're not doing religion, we're not dealing with religion, but yet they're operating in a space in which they're still uh, kind of regurgitating some of this, these religious ideas. So my question, so you sort of spoke to my question just now, but uh, in what ways are sort of the resistance to the multiverse hypothesis of, within science a vestige of science built in kind of an occidental context or something that uh, if the situations were different in another world perhaps if there would be sort of more openness to some of these ideas among modern cosmologists. I know that's hypothetical, but. 
Right. Yeah. Not. I mean, the, so as you may know, the the Dalai Lama is called upon constantly to talk about um, neuroscience and what monks are doing when they're meditating. And there are these like terrible studies that hook up monks to like cathodes, and they're like meditate, and the monks are like, ah, right. Um, and uh, so he gets called upon to talk about this all the time. And he has often said, look, I'll talk about neuroscience and you know what it is that the Buddhist philosophy knows, but I really want to talk about cosmology. Like, does anybody want to talk about cosmology with me? Um, and you know, for the Dalai Lama, um, the multiverse exactly is not a problem at all. He's like, what's what is the issue? This is um, this is exactly what we have been teaching for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so there isn't. So I, my my sense is that a Mahayana trained <laughs> Um, physicist would be like, yeah, we've been we've been up to this percent. This isn't this isn't so um, this isn't nearly so devastating um, as those of us trained up in what Marcelo Gleiser, the cosmologist, he's one of the friends that I have made wonderfully through this. Um, cosmologist Marcelo Gleiser says the problem with Western science is that we're still monotheist. Um, we're, this is, we have a, we're a monotheistic science, and I hear him, you know, uh, channeling Nietzsche here and saying that in its search for a single objective empirical truth out there, um, modern science is in pursuit of a god principle, um, and they use that god principle in order to kill off the, the dad god principle, but that it's still a god principle, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that the, 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 to the extent that you know, so I'm not, I'm on nobody's side here, as you can probably tell, right? To the extent that there's resist, you know, just frenetic resistance to the multiverse hypothesis, that seems to be a, a, um, a holdover of a kind of monotheistic science. Um, and to the extent there's a, you know, a just totally uncritical embrace of the multiverse, that seems to be a lack of training in philosophy. Um, and yes, in fact, some people have studied with David Lewis and his modal realism and are saying like, this is exactly what is going on here. Um, some other modal philosophers will say that David Lewis um, commits what Alfred North Whitehead calls the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is to say, possibility is possibility. And when, when one thing is actualized, everything else is not. And that's just the way it goes. You don't get to have all of them in some hypothetical you know, megaverse. You, get, you, you, you choose one thing and everything else is lost and it sucks, but like you don't, you, that you, there is no you that's living that life, right? There's no me who can draw. I can't draw. There is no, I, I wouldn't, and this is back to Nietzsche, right? I, I wouldn't be me if I could draw. I'd be a totally different human being, right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, thanks. I can't draw. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually got a related uh, question that is connected to some of the things we were t just talking about and having to do with the issue of like the connection of a multiverse idea to manyness or diversity more generally, right? This is the idea that this kind of it, the, the intellectual background of many people who will resist this kind of idea are in a unified conception of, of the way the world is. Um, and I wonder to what extent, because I know for me, a, a multiverse struck me as like, like you were saying with the Dalai Lama, of course, right? This is, I mean, this is no big deal. Um, to what extent the kind of Engagement in something like syncretism or diversity or acceptance of diversity, right, might actually have, might, might affect the way that people are, are inclined to accept or reject um, a multiverse, right? Because it seems like there may be some connection between like uh, kind of social ideas, right, and this notion of the multiverse. Okay. Okay, this is great. And the thing that I didn't talk nearly enough about in this book is science fiction. Um, when, when there, and, and it seems to me there are like two. <laughs> There are two major branches of the science, of the SF tree, and one is the kind that accelerates the sort of settler colonial logic and gets us, um, you know, conquering space and gets us just regurgitating and, and intensifying all the problems that we have created on Earth. Um, and and it, and for what it's worth, I think that the like Spider Verse and the Doctor Strange stuff operates in that key, um, because all those other worlds are for are to stage like intergalactic war. It's just the only thing they're doing there is so that things can explode, right? Um, the other branch of science fiction is, you know, the more speculative fiction um, version that is, uh, you know, has been on the rise for the last. 60 years with people like Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler, Afrofuturists, indigenous futurists, feminist futurists, um, Ursula Le Guin, um, that 
think about other worlds in order actually to imagine other worlds, not just like doing the same thing in some other dimension, but like to, 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 like to live differently. And the thing that's astonishing to me about, with, with that in mind, about the cosmological, the classic cosmological multiverse as we're getting it from contemporary theoretical physicists, is that you don't actually learn about other worlds at all. There's no, there, it, it, there, there's no um, modeling of like, okay, so what if you didn't have an electron? Or what if you do? It's, it's, it, all of these other worlds are just these kind of placeholders, these shells, in order to reaffirm the integrity, the singularity, and the supremacy of our universe. They're not, they don't do anything, right? Um, so, uh, so I don't think, so I, I actually think it's a deeply conservative hypothesis, the multiverse hypothesis. It doesn't tend to be taken up by people who are genuinely interested in other worlds and living otherwise. Yeah. Well, this is more personal, but so for, if you have not read the book, obviously I highly recommend it, but I love that it is so chronological and it treats each step along the way uh, very thoroughly and we pause and we get all kinds of different uh, and it builds beautifully. I was telling Mary Jane that I loved all of the, she's very good about saying, as you might remember, and as I'm reading going, no, actually I don't, MJ, thank you so much for uh, re-spelling out what it is that I completely forgot from a single chapter ago. But my question is, is what is your favorite cosmology of all the ones you treated from the atomists through today and that they're all sort of uh, trying to parse one another or build on one another or knock each other down and there's so many great personalities in the book that were really fun that uh, it made me wonder to whom you were most partial. Can I have two? I have an old guy and a new guy. <laughs> no guy and a new and a new woman. Um, my old guy, the one I love most is Giordano Bruno. Um, I love that guy, right? Um, Giordano Bruno, who has this notion that, um, well, so Giordano Bruno, as you may know, gets executed. This is the thing that people may know about him. It's Ash Wednesday. I mean, like, come on, church. On Ash Wednesday, you do this to this guy. They execute him on an Ash Wednesday in, um, in the year 1600 um, at the Campo del Fiore. And as you may know, there's now a statue of Bruno right there where he was executed and his back is to the Vatican like this. Um, so uh, Bruno uh, was executed uh, for um, having um, denied the integrity of the incarnation, to deny the, the divinity of Christ, um, which he didn't technically do. What he did, I mean, he had like Christ sections here and there, but what he did was he basically said, suggested that like Christ isn't all that interesting because of course Christ is God in the world because the whole world is God in the world. And he has this high theology, this beautiful cosmic theology of the universe as necessarily infinite, totally without end, because its creator is necessarily infinite and totally without end. And what the universe is, is like a material godding of God like a material godding forth of God as the universe. Um, therefore, the universe has to be in, in, in the, the worlds have to be innumerable. Therefore, the universe has to be um, this like pancarnation of um, the whole universe as like bodying forth God. Absolutely stunning, I think, as a cosmology. And amazing work as a cosmology because it turns out uh, Bruno um, was the, the, one of the first to say, like, guys, the, this is not the only solar system. You see those twinkling things out there? They've got planets, too. Um, so he was setting forth respectable, like, post-Copernican philosophy and, and physics uh, and also setting forth this, like, gorgeous... Uh, frankly, pantheist uh, theology that I think is really beautiful. Um, my most favorite contemporary multiverse theorist is uh, Laura Mercini Houghton, who's down at UNC. Unfortunately, she doesn't write anything that's readable at all. Like, it is all in those really technical journals, but it's stunning. Um, and in the book, um, actually, my, my brother, who's a cartoon artist, uh, did a drawing of her, uh, her cosmology that she's very happy with. It looks like champagne flutes kind of erupting into the sky. Um, but there's no sky. It's the, um, they're erupting as sky, right? Um, the, uh, her idea is that there is that, um, oh gosh. Her idea is that when you look at the cosmic microwave background, 
there are some funny things like weirdnesses, um, darker concentrations of temperature and density over here and over here, weird flows. And she's like, you know what that is? Those are, that's evidence of the collision of our universe with other universes at the moment of our, nucle our universe's nucleation. And she says that our universe and every other universe comes from what she calls a multiversal bath, this like primordial sea where you've got these two opposing um, uh, uh, forces. You've got gravity holding everything in, being like, stay in the bath, it's warm and maternal in here. And you've got dark energy or the cosmological constant tending to push universes out. And depending on how much of each of these forces they have, a universe either nucleates like a champagne flute or doesn't. Um, but once it does, she says, the universe bears the um, imprint of its entanglement, its primordial entanglement with every other universe in this multi- I like this aesthetically, I think it's beautiful, but I also like it ethically because of the way that it attends to our, our entanglement with otherness. And it's actually concerned about what these other universes look like and what they do. Um, so those are my favorite. But it's not because I think they're true, right? I just wonder. These are totally aesthetic and ethical preferences. They are pragmatic preferences. I have, I have absolutely no opinion about truth. Yeah. yeah. You always say that. <laughs> it's all pragmatic. OK, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to take some questions and comments from the audience. I think Amanda's going to help us pass the mic around. Hi, thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious, generally, it's a general question that I'll specify a little bit about the intersection of multiverse ideas with ethics primarily and maybe a little bit of politics. And my, my intuition on hearing the multiverse idea without fully understanding the physics and why is like, what an ethically terrible idea. And the way that you sort of said, like, it totally defers any kind of real care for the lives we're leading in this world that we have to deal with. And I, I get similar intuitions on like some of the redemption stories and promises like from Christianity, like everything's gonna be okay in the end, so don't worry about it, something to this effect. So I'm just curious generally, like, but at the same time, a metaphysics we shouldn't reject just because we don't like it. <laughs> and so that's the political tie-in is that this happens on the political side too. It's like, here's a theory of how the world is or, or something. And someone might say, well, I don't like the political outcomes of that, therefore I'm throwing that away. That's an impossible idea to even consider. And so just generally, how do you, what might your take on those intersections be? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I agree. For the most part, I think most multiverse scenarios are a kind of escapist fantasy, um, end up functioning as a kind of escapist fantasy, like, oh gosh, we've completely wrecked this, not just this world, but like low earth orbit, we're about to go wreck everything else. Like maybe there are other universes out there that will fare better um, than this one. Um, I think that the reason, you're absolutely right, you don't get to just choose um, which, which truths you want or something like that based on um, what feels good. Um, the issue is that these theories are operating so far beyond ver verifiability that I think that the only way to treat them really is as stories, um, as myths. And then to ask how the myths function, what kinds of, and then I go back to, you know, like the encyclopedia of religion's entry on cosmogony, on creation stories, says that every creation story gives you a, some sort of primordial scene, the eruption of dualisms, um, the gradual assembly into some kind of order, um, and then an ethic that says, insofar as this is the way that the world was created, this is what you should go and do with it, right? Um, and we know that Genesis does this, and we know that Cheyenne cosmologies do this, and we know that the Rig Veda does this, and we know that. Um, I'm trying to look at these cosmogenies, these, these uh, scientific cosmogenies, and ask, like, where's the ethic? Because it's in there somewhere, but they don't say it straightforwardly, but it's in there somewhere. Um, and then from there, ask just the way I would ask of any of our, um, you know, terrestrial mythologies, like, what is this asking us to do, and which kind of stories might we want to live in relation to, and which ones might we not? Um, but I, I've already given up on the prospect of vi verifiability or anything, so that's why I, I feel like it's all right to operate in that terrain. Um, but, you know, it may be possible. It may be possible that at some point people will decide, yes, those marks on the cosmic microwave background are actually evidence of other universes rather than space dust. But I really doubt it. There's such, it, I, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where we know whether or not 
there are universes beyond the bounds of what we are capable of knowing, which is like literally what our universe is, right? So yeah, yeah. If you wanna, if you wanna pick a story, I mean, I, you you can just I, what what I do in this. I do, I'm just like, oh, this is cool. This one says this. This one says that. This one says the other thing. Um, and it, I I would ask the same question to again anybody who who studies the religions of the world. You know, you can study them in such a way that you just say like, look at this amazing thing that these people do, and look at this is amazing that these people, and just understand them all on their own terms. Or if you end up picking one, you pick the one you like. And I know it doesn't sound right because you're not just, but, but that's basically what we do. Um, so I think if you're going to pick one, yeah, pick the one you like, or just you know revel in the beautiful multiplicity of all of these stories and what they're and what they're telling us. Yeah. Thank you all so much for such a fascinating discussion, um, and for a wonderful book that I look forward to reading. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in the material consequences of beliefs, and so I'm curious if you could maybe take the Giordano Bruno um, example and put it against the backdrop of one of these theoretical physics examples, and maybe this is in the book, and I'm sorry if this is redundant, but I'm just curious about the material consequences of these beliefs, like what are the physical practices that may result from these ways of thinking? Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it could, because uh, so um, we could we could talk sort of institutional practices. Um, the uh, if string theory doesn't actually find a way to solve its um, measure problem, um, which is to say the distribution of. Uh, the distribution of worlds within a uh, 10 to the 500 possible ways of compactifying 11 dimensional space time um, and like produce something measurable, it could be that uh, there will be many fewer string theorists in physics departments. At the moment, there are a lot of string theorists in a lot of physical in a lot of physics departments uh, because there's a lot of hope that string theory might actually reconcile um, quantum mechanics and general relativity. It's it's the the sort of great hope, um, but it it hasn't. I mean, it does theoretically, but it hasn't been proven in any. And so, if string theory doesn't deliver at some point, um, its commitment to um, its own kind of multiverse, the string theory landscape, um, might. Uh, result in a dramatic truncation of that particular field. I mean, that's, um, I, don't, I don't see that anybody's getting, you know, executed these days for these sorts of ideas. Um, and I also don't see that, so, so there's like an institutional um, question of respectability and things like that. Um, but I also don't see a lot of, um, I don't see a lot of ecological activists. I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, committed uh, forest protectors or anything caring at all about the multiverse. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have those kinds of uh, concrete um, repercussions for our own action as we try to care for our increasingly um, convulsing planet, if that, yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, just, I haven't yet read your book, but I, it just reminded me a lot of the theory of, like Deleuze's theory of the fold and Leibniz's idea that every mon monad contains the whole universe in it and how um, Leibniz's idea of that we're in all, the best of all possible worlds and every, there's, you know, inf like almost as if yeah, all possible worlds unfolded in God's mind and he's picked the best one. So, um, so that all possible worlds and multiple verses have sort of existed in God's mind, but we're just actively, yeah, it's unfolded into the right, most best possible one. And yeah, I was just curious how you've engaged with that idea. And um, also, what did you say about, um, yeah, the, the, you wouldn't be you if you couldn't, if you could draw. Um, you were saying that was a oh, yeah. misunderstanding of, or misplaced, I, I can't, can you just elaborate what that was? Um, yeah, because it reminded me of the idea of deprivation, like is that just because I can't fly, does that mean that's a, neg like a negative 
reading of myself, it, or is that, is that necessarily a negative thing, or is that? Sure. Oh, yeah, no, thank I, you. good. Um, that's more interesting than the point I was making. Um, the, so on the issue of um, Leibniz, yes, you go from Leibniz to David Lewis, and all of those possible worlds out of which God chooses the best of all possible worlds themselves all also become actual. So, so David Lewis takes this sort of modal thinking and makes it modal realism. Um, and what that, the reason that the, the book I wrote after this ends up being on pantheism, because I was like, oh my gosh, look at this, the, philo the physicists are actually pantheists, which is to say the mind of God is the universe, it's like the, the multiverse itself, enacting all of these concrete universes that in the earlier tradition were in the mind of God possible. Now they're actual out there in their own space times. And the compendium of that, I want to say, is this like very incarnate God for them, right? Um, so that's that's the that's the that's the lineage. The possible in Leibniz becomes actual in the 20th and 21st century for the the, the Lewis crowd and the, the multiverse theorists, um, especially people like Max Tegmark. He's the big guy there. Uh, sorry, you look confused. Yes, they're totally physically separate. Yes. So in depend. Yeah, they're not good Deleuzians. I mean, that, right? That, that it's a, it's, it's this very sort of plotting. There's a universe here, separated by a whole bunch of space time that's you know racing outward, and then there's a universe there. Um, or if you get to, it, but it totally depends on the different model. The different model will locate universes in different kinds of dimensions and different um, along different kinds of dimensionalities. Um, the thing about that I was saying about not being able to draw is that from a from a Nietzschean standpoint. The question of like, you know, when the, 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 these these uh, sort of many worlders will say like, okay, um, so in this room, we are we have all chosen to stay here for the entirety of this particular panel, right? But there is a world in which one of you got up and left because you were like, I am so bored, or I'm so hungry, or I'm so tired, or I'm so annoyed, or I'm so whatever, right? And you went outside to get a cup of coffee, and the barista was so beautiful that you fell in love with the barista, and you ended up moving to Corfu, and you blah, blah. Meanwhile, the you who's in this room is just, okay. What Nietzsche wants to say is, this is absurd, this thinking. And it assumes that there's some kind of essential self, right, who subtends the one who stays and the one who goes and the one who can draw and the one who does music and the one who has pink hair and the one who has blue hair and the whatever. There is no such essential self. All the self is is a kind of shifting um, provisional name for all the shit that's happened to you over your life, right? And that's constantly changing and constantly. But if any one of those things that has happened to you were at all different, you would not be you. You'd be a totally different person, right? Therefore, he just, he sort of shuts down ahead of time the question of like, oh, what would I be in another universe? Where am I? He's like, you're not in another universe. This is it. All you are are the total, are the accidents that compose this um, like illusion of you-ness. And now we're back to Buddhism, right? <laughs> Well, uh, we should give our speaker and award winner a little break because we'll be having a, a keynote <laughs> coming up right after this. So you, you'll have other chances to ask questions and maybe, maybe corner Mary Jane over drinks and ask her some of these mind-blowing things. Uh, I want to thank you all again for a really interesting conversation. And um, please join me in congratulating Dr. Rubenstein again on her Iris Award.